This study will be on the armor of God. While we will touch on all of the armor, we will focus in mainly on the shield of faith today. Before we get started, let's open in prayer. Father, we ask that this study would open our eyes, that we would be ready for the world that we live in, that we would be able to defend ourselves from the attacks. We ask that you would open our hearts this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Text today is Ephesians 6, 11 to 18. There it says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now principalities and powers and all of that, those are ranks or levels of the enemies in the spiritual realm that we are fighting against. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So again, this study is on the shield of faith, and we're going to go back to Ephesians 6, verse 16, to read that again. And it says, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will, not must, or not could, not may, but will be able to quench all, that's not some, that's not most, that's all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So that tells us when our faith is fully grown, there's nothing that can be thrown at us that will shake us. But before we look at the Roman armor, I want to take a look at the modern day armor. Because this is a shield that we would more associate with today. The Roman times, the times Paul's writing to, they would have recognized a Roman soldier. Today we would recognize a police officer or a soldier if we were talking about armor, things like tactical vests, helmets, rifles, and shields. Now this shield listed here, or pictured, is the phalanx shield named after the fighting formation. However, it's not made to stop rocks and arrows, it's made to stop bullets. It's angled, hard on the outside, textured. The entire purpose of the shield is to stop the attack before it hits anything attached to your body. So it's about standoff. It gives you a standoff distance that will protect you. Now, modern day armor, if it gets through that shield, it's going to hit the vest. And the vest in most patrol operations, now modern day armor has plate carriers and we know that, but I want to look at the soft armor that's usually underneath, and that is it does have a deformation that goes towards the back or the body when hit by a round. And what that does is it's actually like a punch. So when you get hit by the round, you will take bruising, possibly broken ribs, and if it's serious enough, trauma. And that's with modern day armor. It also resets, meaning once it's hit, it flexes in, but it also flexes out. Now, old armor, the breastplate, when it was dented, that did not reset. So if it's deformed back into your body, it's painful, and it's continuous. And that is why the shield is so important, because it is that standoff that we need. So the shield of faith. If the shield of faith can absorb threats, then you're not harmed. So how strong is your faith? Has it been tested? Now, when we talk about a shield, we picture like what I just put up on there. Uh -huh. The shield, the phalanx shield, or maybe even the Roman shield that we'll look at here in a little bit. However, depending on your age, if you're younger, you're thinking about an all-encompassing force field. 
So keep that in mind. And when it's tested, you know or determine the threat level at which it will stop something. So actual armor testing today doesn't lend itself to that piece of armor being able to be used again because it's what's known as destructive testing, meaning that as we shoot it or test it, we are reaching its fail point, meaning it's no longer serviceable. Once it fails, we take a step back and we say, this is what it's rated to, or this is what it will stop. However, that's not really how our shield of faith reacts. It's, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Our armor, or our shield that protects our armor, is actually more like muscle. And it would be more like working out, whereas as we do reps, high weight or multiple reps, we tear down the muscle. And as the attacks come, we actually are wearing down our faith. But it makes a good point that it comes back stronger when we get through the other side. Look at how many times you've entered a situation where you've wondered where God was or why he would allow something to come upon you. Sickness, illness, um, injury, work problems, home problems, addiction, anything like that. Why would he allow that? Well, there's two reasons. One is we still have free will, which means we have to determine if we're the one putting ourselves in this situation. Or two, he's allowing it because he's working out our shield of faith. It's only that time when we are facing tribulation or setbacks that our faith is worn down and built back stronger. You have to go through those in increasing levels in order to get your shield stronger. Again, it's more like a muscle than the destructive testing that we would see with modern day armor. But as usual, when we look at shield, what we're seeing is that it has a deeper meaning. So if we dig a little bit here, we're going to see what that deeper meaning is. But first off, think here for the next minute or so. What is another word you could use to think of that would mean shield? Because hidden in the Greek is something Paul, I believe, wants us to know about our shield of faith, and in fact, the armor as a whole. But it doesn't come across well in the English. But the readers, they ended up getting it. But we don't because we don't speak Greek. So what does Paul actually mean or convey when he's talking about the shield of faith? Well, we need to look at the actual Greek words. And the Greek word that is used here is the only place it's used in the Bible, and that is thyreos. Now, thyreos is a word that comes from another word. And that root word that it comes from is known as a lemma, L-E-M-M-A. And the lemma to thyreos is thyra. So thyra would be like if we were put into a room full of chairs, different types of chairs, stools and folding cha chairs, recliners, rocking chairs. You get the point. And I said, please, sit in the chair. You could possibly look at me wondering, well, which chair do you want me to sit in? Please, sit in that chair. But I don't point and I don't look at one. Well, you're going to have to try to figure that out. And when you figure that out, you reach from the lemma to where we have thyreos. And that is, I want you to sit in the folding chair. Well, now you know what, you're, what we're talking about. And so the root word thyra in Greek means door or entrance. And there are four different uses of this root word in the Bible. And those four different words are used 46 different times. Let's take a look at those each. So the first one is thyra, which we already said is a door, an entrance, or a gate. It's used 39 of the 46 times. 34 of those 39 times, it's used or translated in the English as door. Now one of those times it's referred to as access, such as a door or a doorway, but it's still in that term. Three of the times it's used as an entrance, and two times as a gate. Now, the next way it's translated is thy, I think I'm going to pronounce this right, thyroros, something close to that, and it means doorkeeper. 
which is also along the same lines as door and entrance and gate, which is because it's a root word of that. It's used four times, and all four times are in the Gospels. Mark used it once. John followed up using it three times. The next one is Thyrus. Thyrus means window. Now, while this is still an opening and a point of weakness to attack, it's used two times, but we're still on the same line, same meanings. And then we come across Thyrios, which we've already discussed means shield. But shield, if you're looking at the other three ways that this word is used, it's a completely different mindset. Door, entrance, gate, doorkeeper, window. Those are all along the same lines. And then we come to shield. So what it's actually saying is that our faith is the doorway, the gateway, or the entrance through which all attacks must first go. In other words, when I pick up my shield of faith, I close the door, the gateway, or the entrance through which the enemy can attack me. And if I put my faith down... I open the doorway, the gateway or the entrance through which I allow attacks to hit the armor that's beneath. Now as we continue, we're going to look at the Roman shield. This is the Roman shield. It was roughly four feet long, two and a half feet wide, and can hide roughly a man-sized soldier behind it. It was made of three layers of bonded wood strips, much like modern-day plywood. And if you've ever seen people breaking a board in karate or martial arts, you see somebody who's holding it, and they look at the board kind of on the side. What they're looking at is which way is the grain going? Because if you kick with the grain pointed the right way, the board's going to quick, uh, easily break. If you kick facing the wrong way, it's going to be much tougher. So what they did is they put the grain one way, the next layer was a different way, and the next layer, another way, and thus it became like modern-day plywood, increasing the strength. It was then covered by leather on the outside with a bronze rim covering the rounded edges for additional protection. Now, each soldier would be given their shield and be responsible for it for life, just as we're responsible for our faith. And there was some maintenance that had to be done. So how did they care for their shield, much like we have to care for ours? Well, they had to anoint their shield daily with oil, or the leather would become brittle and fail in battle. Think about that. Every day we should be anointing ourselves in the Word of God and in prayer, or we will become brittle and our faith will fail, fail under trial or attack during battle. Now, another interesting thing is the Romans, before a battle in which flaming arrows might be shot at them, the soldiers would actually wet the leather covering, which would cause the water to extinguish the arrows if it hit them. Because we do have a wooden shield here, and if a flaming arrow had gotten through, it could actually burn through the shield. So, we have to know our enemy, the tactics they will use, and the weaponry they have access to before we go to battle so that we can prepare our armor, much like the Romans did, in order to survive or safely get through this attack. It's going to look at some tactical uses of the shield. Now, they would use it, obviously, in a fighting formation. And these edges would be placed against each other, like you can see here on the front row, to form an interlocking wall, essentially. Think of the Spartan 300s in the movie 300, if you've seen it. When the charging comes, it hits a single wall, and it can't be moved. Now, the curve of the shield would assist in directing the attack to the sides of it, and if a split happened in between the two shields, there was the sword waiting to come through and remind people that this is probably not a good place to be. This formation meant that the center was extremely strong. Now, the brass or bronze ring on the side, rim, was there in case of a swiping attack so that it didn't shatter. But what about overhead attack? They would use what was called the tortoise formation, which you see here on the right. And they would close ranks with their shields, with the first row 
holding their shields edge to edge in the front, just like the normal formation. And then the back rows would overlay them, much like shingles, causing rocks and such to roll off to the front. And in this formation, they were practically invulnerable to arrows, rocks, and even spears. But when you're going to get contact, you close ranks and you go to the front row that you see here on the right. Not necessarily the, the top covering because they do not have much maneuverability. It is purely a defensive. But you can see it from modern day riot tactics with the police as to why these lines would be the way they are. Now, as I brought up the 300, although they're not you know, Romans, they're Greeks, but the 300 made an important stand at the hot gates of Thermopylae, as depicted, against a king known as Xerxes. Most Christians apparently don't realize that Ahasuerus of Esther is Xerxes. And it's after the banquet where Queen Vashti is deposed as queen because she refuses to come and see King uh, Xerxes or Ahasuerus, depending on which name you want to use. He deposes her as queen. He then, in between, ends up going on this battle where the 300 stand at the hot gates of Thermopylae takes place. They're outnumbered quite a bit. And they end up all giving their life. And why is that? Because they were betrayed. They were betrayed because their strength was in the fact that no one fought alone. Each one bore the weight of their brother next to them or in front of them. Each one was stronger together than alone. We as Christians are called to be the body of Christ, not the bodies, the body of Christ. A cloud of witness. It's all singular. The church, not churches. Everything is singular. We should be acting as one purpose, as the church did in Acts. And the church in Acts was doing amazing things, far better than I believe we are doing today, especially here in the United States. But what does the enemy use to attack? How does the enemy get around? Well, in the 300, we know that there was a traitor that let them get, get in behind them, thus causing them to forfeit this formation and allowed them to get through. They had held the gates long enough to save the nation. However, they all had to give their life to do so. We know that we have won the war. Christ is very clear of that. But we also don't want to give up our lives in the battle if we don't have to. We would rather be here to rapture instead of death. Because that's the blessed hope, right? The blessed hope is the rapture of the church that we will never see death nor taste it. However, the tactics of the enemy is a doctrine of demons. We should not be deceived because deception is his main weapon. And what we see is churches are more worried about attendance, giving, and acceptance than they are about preparing and protecting the flock. And so, since the beginning of the church, we have created denominations, we have created all different sects of the Christian faith, and not that if you go to a non-denominational church that you're automatically correct. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the church as a whole should be one body, acting in one accord. But what, what, what we've allowed to happen is the enemy to come around to the rear with deceiving doctrine that tickles our ears, as warned of in the Bible. And then we get a group of our soldiers who rally against it. Or, much like those who are supposed to be guarding the path that aren't true soldiers, maybe they're not true Christians, they're just there guarding the back, they form up and either flee or are slaughtered. Remember the parable of the sower, where the plant sprouts quickly but then is withered in the sun and dies. So the church today is fractured. It's no longer one fighting unit, but we have become multiple units, almost facing each other more so than the enemy. And that's, I believe, why we are failing. And this year, 2024, I believe we need more unity than ever. 
because we are going to be tested more than ever in this year coming up. Now, there's more to this than just the word shield. And that is, at the very beginning, he says, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Above is the Greek word epi. And there's something very interesting about epi, and that is, epi is very common in the New Testament, used 875 times. But only 35 of the 875 times is it translated as above. So before you believe this is a heretic speaking, understand that, yes, the Bible is good for teaching, good for reproof, infallible, inspired Word of God. But that's the original language. In parts, it's Hebrew. In parts, it's Aramaic. In parts, it's Koine Greek. In no part is it English. Our English Bibles are great. They do everything we need to come to faith, spread the word, and that. But for us to get the true gems mined out of it, we have to do a little bit more work. And here in the United States, God has given us the ability, the freedoms, and access to information to do so. So the onus is on us. But every one of our translations, English versions, are translations. To include King James, New King James, ESV, NIV, NLT, it doesn't matter. They're all translations. So understand, they did an amazing job, but it's probably and is not completely perfect. And so it's our job to look and see if there's some things that we can see deeper. And that is, why not look at this word epi? Now, on the screen is a word study of the word epi in the 875 times that it's used. As you can see by the golden arrow, above is so small that I had to add the word. It's not even in there in the chart. Epi is translated as on 784 times. So maybe we should just humor ourselves and use it with on once and see what it does. On all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, if you're like me, above all, if you're 20 or under and you see this force field shield, that would probably make sense. It's above, outside of, not touching. And in fact, I think the true meaning Paul was trying to get past is better understood that way. It doesn't matter the direction of the attack, your shield will protect you. It's an all-encompassing thing. But we are supposed to be facing the enemy because we are to be offensive, not defensive. Remember, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Well, shall not prevail, a better translation of that one is shall not withstand. Because although shall not prevail is true, it will not. It kind of gives us the imagery that we're holding on by our fingertips, and that gives us a mental justification to believe possibly the lie of the enemy that we're not to be offensive, we are to be defensive, and so long as the church still exists, we're doing what we're supposed to. But when you change that to cannot withstand, now we are to be offensive. We are to be storming the enemy. And remember, this verse we're looking at specific, or not the verse, but the section of, of Ephesians that we are looking at. Ephesians 6, 11 to 18 specifically says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It is not a justification to go after any person. For we wrestle against principalities and powers. So looking at on, the shield strength seems to be linked. Again, above all would be a, outside of those. But when you put on all, you have to put stuff on first. Then you put it on. And it seems that it's linked to the three things behind it, or which are listed first. And the order Paul lists, the armor also doesn't appear to be random. It appears to be a specific reason the Holy Spirit gave us these in that order. And we're going to take a look at those real quick. The first piece of armor we're going to look at is the belt of truth. That's accepting that you are a sinner. The truth that you need a Savior. Figuring out the truth that you'll never be good enough. The truth 
is that we don't have truth. Unless you follow Oprah Winfrey and you think that you have your own truth in which you are your own God, that's not truth. You can't have your own truth. It doesn't exist. So we take the truth of the Bible, the truth of God, so we have to take his belt and put it on and gird our loins, as it says. And what that means is they wore those longer clothing that goes down, much like in you see in Afghanistan and such. They go down probably to the ankles. But while it per out offers protection, what it does not offer is freedom of movement. And so when you would, quote, gird your loins, you would pull it up, and then you would use the belt to hold it there, allowing your legs to move, giving you more maneuverability and speed. The next is righteousness. This is the breastplate. And this is the standard that you have to have to enter heaven. You can't have anything less than the standard, and the standard is perfection. And none of us have that. But in order to accept the fact that you don't have the righteousness to get in, you have to accept the truth of the Bible. Otherwise, you may think you are, because you're a good person. doesn't matter. And so we take... Jesus' breastplate of his righteousness, and we put it on us, because it's not ours. We have to put it on us. And it guards our heart, our lungs, and our organs. Now, an interesting thing is the lungs. The words spirit, wind, and breath all come from the same lemma, remember the root word, which is ruach in Hebrew. So what was Adam, before the breath of God, breathed into him? He was dust and clay, but he became a living being when God placed his ruach, his breath, into him. Likewise, we are dead until God places his Holy Spirit into us, his ruach, into us. And it is the wind of God, the breath of God. So there's a deeper meaning. And then we come to the gospel, known as the gospel of peace. And Jesus shows how to obtain his righteousness through his sacrifice as our Savior. The gospel is known as the shoes because it's what gives you your traction. It's upon which you can move forward. It's upon which you stand in your faith. So the gospel is the foundation, but it is Jesus came 100% as man in the flesh, just like us, but also 100% God, just like the Father, lived a sinless life because he always kept his eyes on the Father. He sacrificed himself on Good Friday. He stormed both chambers of Sheol, that's Hades and Abraham's bosom, on what I would call Silent Saturday. And he is brought back on Resurrection Sunday. Then he ascends and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty to make intercession for us with his righteousness on our behalf. That is the gospel. And every, I would dare say pretty much every person in church knows John 3.16. Most people who don't even go to church know John 3.16. But why can no one tell you John 3.17? And I believe it's because it has a word in there that gives us pause, and some even panic. So let's take a look at it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that word might is where we get panic. Because the enemy will tell you, you might be saved but you have this addiction. You've stolen. You've committed adultery, murder, anything like that. And real Christians wouldn't do that. So you you might be saved, but you're probably not, right? That's the tactic, the attack of the enemy. And while that might is true, it's not based on Jesus, because Jesus is faithful and able to save, because there is only one thing that can keep Jesus from saving us. And it's not that it's more powerful than the sacrifice and blood of Jesus. It's only that God is just and kept his promise of giving us free will. And that is, 
blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the un only unforgivable sin. Now keep in mind, if we continue to do things we ought not here, we will face repercussions in this life. But if we are truly Christians and we are grieved of our sin, that we will, will much less often commit and in less frequency, severity, meaning well, you may start down that path but then hop right back off. That's the sign that you're changed is that you're saved. It's only the fact that we would choose not to accept his sacrifice that we would not be saved. That's the might. The might is us. It's not him. And then we look at the word begotten. Most Christians can't tell you what this means. And in fact, arguments have been made from some who say he's begotten. Got, got because he was created, born of a woman, and thus he's a created being. And it says he is the firstborn of the Father, meaning... He wasn't always with him. He was born. And those are lies, too. Because the word begotten is actually monogenesis. And the meaning of monogenesis is pertaining to what is unique in the sense of being the only one of the same kind or class. Unique. Only. So what that actually says is that Jesus is unique and the only one who was born in the flesh but is also of the same kind and class as God, the Father Almighty. None of the other heavenly beings are in that class. No other born person is in that class. But just as amazing as that is, because he was born of a woman, he is also monogenesis to us, meaning he is unique and only of our kind or class from the heavenly beings. Because he is, God the Father is spirit. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is spirit. And Jesus became flesh. So he is monogenesis with God the Father and with us. Should not perish. We shouldn't, because we have the option to choose. But much like going into the amusement park, if I bought you a ticket but you refuse to take it at the gate, they're not going to let you in. You have to take the ticket. That's the salvation, the blood, the sacrifice of Jesus. Take the ticket and be able to get in refuse to take the ticket, and you can't get in. Nobody is going to be able to see God on Judgment Day and say, you sent me to the lake of fire. That is going to be, and no matter how much they argue now, they will not be able to argue before him that they did not choose it. I don't care where you're from. If you're from the Amazon and never met anybody in the civilized world, world he is giving them visions. He is faithful. He is just. They will have a chance. So if we read this with the monogenesis built into this, just John 3.16, and we'll see why John didn't write it this way, because it, most people probably wouldn't want to read it again or remember it, but it says, For God the Father so loved the world that God the Father gave God the Father's only begotten, only unique, Son, who's the same as him, but unique because he was born in the flesh, that whoever believes in this unique God-born Son should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what that means. And monogenesis is also the word used in Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. The question here is, some will tell you your Bible is wrong because it says Isaac is the only son of Abraham. And then they say, what about Ishmael? Or the children that were born after Sarah's death when he remarried. While Ishmael was given a nation because he was a child of Abraham, he was not the child of promise. Only Isaac is the child of promise, specifically stated by God the Father. And so, if you see the italics of the word son here at the end of verse 17, that's because it's not in the original language. It's not in Hebrew. So it actually ends as he offered, or I'm sorry, when he was tested, but offered Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten, his monogenesis here in Hebrew. So son isn't in, I'm sorry, in this is the New Testament, so it's in Greek. 
So son would be Greek. It's not in the Greek. It's the only, his only monogenesis. That's because he is the only one who has the same promise of being a nation to God, separate to himself, that he gave to Abraham in Genesis 12. And he did that because he separated the nations in Genesis 11. And if you look at the spiritual intelligence, you'll see that that is because in Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, we're told he separated them according to the heavenly beings, or Israel, but Israel didn't exist. And I go into greater detail there. But Isaac is the only one who has this only begotten son status. And it makes more sense. It's after we get the truth that we're a sinner, the righteousness of Jesus that we need, and the truth that he sacrificed himself, and we have access to that, that we can develop faith. Here's our shield. And we believe on Jesus. You saw in John 3.16, it said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that who believes in him? But in James 2.19, we see something. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So believing in God isn't the standard. The demons believe in God and tremble. The false Christians believe in God and tremble. Those of different faiths believe in a God, but not Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father is through him. So the goal is not believing in God. That's not where salvation is found. But in Acts 16.31, we see, So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Some take that to mean, My mom's a big Christian, faithful person. My dad's a faithful person. I'm of their household. I must be saved. That's not what it means. What it means is that when you are saved, you will teach or show the truth to your family and then your household will be saved. But on, that's highlighted here, that word is epi. It's the exact same word we've been looking at. And if we go to John 8, 44, we're going to make a jump here. Jesus says to the, quote, believers of the day, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. This might seem like a little bit of a jump, and what are you talking about? But understand, it's at this point in the armor we start to develop faith that we're going to make that leap to salvation. And we look at it, and we know we choose God. We then go to God, the side of the war that God is on. We become His, which means we weren't His before. And there's only two sides. So if you're not with God, you have to be on the enemy side. There's no in-between. There's no neutral party. So much like in North Korea, when those are being held hostage and they flee across the DMZ. The North Koreans shoot at them. They try to kill them because the dear leader cannot continue to tell them that the North Korea is a great place or he is such a good person because as soon as you get out of North Korea, it is evidently clear that you've been lied to. It is evidently clear that it is better outside of North Korea. And they, if, you, if you're a soldier, they say you have defected. Well, we are in a war. So salvation is, in fact, a defection from the father of this world, Satan, the enemy side, to Jesus. Unlike those who escape North Korea, they don't go back and try to convert others. That's where we become offensive. We are supposed to be telling people the good news. We can't force them. You can't force somebody to choose. You can make them say words, but you cannot make them believe. And it's not the words they say, but the faith that they have, the belief. So no one in Christianity should ever be trying to force people to Jesus. It doesn't work. But once there is defection, the reason the enemy is so scared is because it is our job to be infection. We are to infect those who are still on the other side, with the truth so that they can get well. And so that's the job of the Christian. At defection, we have salvation, which is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's known as the helmet, because it's covering our mind. 
This is where we really sign up for Jesus's war. It's also where the Bible comes alive. It's then when we read the word, which is, it's the sword, obviously. But when you receive the spirit, you can receive the word and the truth of the word. Because it's kind of like reading a book in Chinese if you don't speak Chinese or read Chinese. And then people who don't have the faith, they say, well, I don't believe the Bible. I've read the Bible. It doesn't make any sense. But then once you're saved, the Holy Spirit is the one who Ruach breathed through inspiration the word to the prophets, the disciples, brought the situations and events back into their memory, the words of Christ, so that they could write these 66 books which compile the Bible. Then when you have the key, the Holy Spirit is the key to the word, then you learn Chinese. It's then that the word comes alive in your life. It's then that it cuts not between bone and marrow, but between spirit and soul. It's then that as you read through it, so you do it every year, you can get different things because you're in different places, and it's alive. It's not a static book. It's not like anything else in the word, or world. It's the word of God. And through that, we come to 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 12. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, just the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man, which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Now we are armed for our offensive, our offensive battle. And that brings us to prayer. We are to pray his word back to him. Modern day believers, some call this the spear because it can be cast at a great distance and it hits hard. But it's not given that by Paul. He just says to pray. But in order to pray effectively, we have to pray his word back to him, which means we have to accept it as truth. We have to have accepted his righteousness to understand the gospel that we needed, to develop the faith, to shield ourselves so that we can gain the salvation, to get the key, to read the word, and then pray it back to him which unlocks everything. You see, if you're like me, when you first start reading, especially in Psalms, you see David doing things like, God, do this. God, do that. And you're thinking, I've studied this. And David's a five foot, almost nothing, redhead, ruddy dude who's telling God what to do. And it really comes off as kind of forward, kind of puts you back. But when you see those things, you have to ask yourself, not what do I think, but how does God see him? God says he is the apple of my eye. In effect, he will essentially be the vice president of the millennial reign. And so the question is then, what am I missing that God's seeing? Because obviously I'm wrong. God is right. And you look at Samuel when he went on his, quote, secret mission, to sacrifice, but the true mission was to anoint David as king when Paul or Saul failed to kill the Amalekites. Even David's father didn't bring him down to be in the running. All of his brothers are there, but not David. And so we see the thing about David that sets him apart is his faith. Yes, he has problems. We have the Bathsheba and Uriah issue. But unlike Saul, David never lost the Holy Spirit. God never took it from him. And in fact, he says, I will, I will suffer through things in the future. But David, because who he was who he was and had faith in me, I will never remove an heir from the throne of Israel that is not above David. Saul did things for himself and because he feared the people more than God. David feared God more than anything. And we look at David and Goliath. And why does he fight Goliath? It's not because he stood against Israel. It's because he taunted the living God. That's why he stood up. And then David is anointed. He does great things. 
But for 25 years, David runs in the wilderness. And you have to wonder, was David wondering, like, I'm anointed king, and I've done nothing wrong, and now I'm running. And it ends up being year after year. And Saul never believes in himself that he can stop trying to kill David because he knows the throne has been taken from him. If you don't believe that, look at the two times Saul was handed over to David. In the, in the cave, where Saul goes in to relieve himself, and David cuts off a piece of his robe and then tells him. And then later on, when he's asleep and David sneaks in and takes his spear and water jug, it's in those that both times he comes out and tells Saul what he did, and Saul an announces that David is far more righteous than he, and that nation has been given over to David. He knows it. He's still trying to kill him because he's not a man of faith, especially not like David. What is happening? God is preparing David. And in both of those instances, the cave and when he saw us sleeping, the people who are with David says, God has given him into your hand. Bring up your sword and slay him now and take the kingdom. But David knows God. He knows Romans 13.1. Before Romans 13 and 1 is ever penned or wrote, and that is all authority is appointed by God, no authority is appointed that is not appointed by God. That being said, yes, David has been appointed, anointed king, but he has not been given the throne. And if God wanted him to have the throne, then David says, I would have had it, but I shall not reach out my hand against God's anointed. And that's Saul. And in fact, that the guy who brings him good news is killed because he rejoices in the death of God's anointed. The enemy who has been chasing David, trying to take his life for 25 years. But because he's God's anointed, David never in the entire time says anything bad about Saul. That is amazing to me. If you have a bad boss or a bad friend or an irritating whatever, but they've been put in a position of power over you by God... Can you say the same thing? That's a big ask to me. And so David's shield is being strengthened through tasks here and there, here and there, here and there. But the last task, you see what it takes to be in the position that David was in. And that is, he's fled to Gath, the very place of the Philistines, which is the home of Goliath, which doesn't make sense that he would flee there. He fakes madness. He ends up living in Ziklag for a while. And on the day of this battle, the day that the nation of Israel will be handed over to David, the king tells him, not Saul, but the king of the Philistines, says, you can't go with us. I trust you, but my generals don't. I dare believe he would have turned against them and saved Saul had he gone. So again, He's sent away. And it's at that time that he comes to Ziklag, sees it burned with fire. And all of his 600 men, their families, wives and children, all their possessions are taken and the city is burning. That's got to be a hit. You have to feel left. Like God is not, not with you, right? And even his men turn on David and it says they contemplated stoning him. Does David blame God? No. Does David say anything? Doesn't appear so. It says he went and strengthened himself in the Lord, in prayer. And then he asks, should I chase them? And if I do, will I recover all? And God goes, yes. So David rallies up all 600 men. Now this is a hit to the shield. Your faith has to be crumbling. And then coming back, and then crumbling and coming back. But it's got to be, at this point, David's faith has to be, his shield is thick. So off he goes. And he drives his men so hard that when they get to the river, 200 of them can't cross because they're so fatigued. So they leave these guys in the rear with the gear. They push across the river and make contact with a slave who randomly, it would appear, if you don't believe that God has taken care of them, has been left behind. And he says they have been taken by the Amalekites. The Amalekites 
invented many of the things that you see Hamas and Hezbollah and ISIS doing. They invented skinning people alive. This is why the men were so upset when their families were taken. Because they know what these people would do. Much like we see the families who must be in torment over the October 7th kidnapping of many of these people. They know they're being tortured. They know they're being raped. Still, so modern day, linked back then. So David ends up going and recovering all. And what do his men say? His men say, we'll give back those 200 people, their wives and their children, but we will not give them back the spoils of war or their property because they didn't push like we did. They didn't go forward and fight. And David says, that's not what we're going to do. Everyone gets their stuff back. God gave it back. You didn't get it back. And he sets a standard in Israel that day that no matter if you fight or you're with the gear, you earn the same. It, David comes back and he rules a nation. And his shield doesn't just cover him. It covers the entire nation of Israel because he's in charge. So what does it take to do that? He started this. He prays these prayers that seem very forward very aggressive to God. But in fact, what God sees is a level of faith that he doesn't see in others. And that is, David ends up going into a pickle, getting himself into pickles, and even a whole pickle jar, and he prays to God. But what he says is, God, I'm in this jar of pickles, and I need out, and you need to get me out. Because the only reason I'm here is because I didn't go around I went straight in because you told me to do that. In faith that you would get me out of this, I have gotten myself into it. And God stands up and takes over. Look at how the enemy attacks. The enemy attacks by separating. If you've ever seen National Geographic, the way lions hunt zebras, what do they do? They pick the weak, the young, and the old. The weak and the young, those would be the New Christians, if you will, their shields aren't developed. But the old, those are the ones that are worn down, if you will. Just an example. And so what do they do? They separate them from the herd. So long as they're with the herd, they do have a much higher level of protection. We are to stay with each other. But when they get separated, when we get separated through depression, guilt, shame, the things that Jesus took, or... Again, by our own free will, because we don't want to walk through the hard part, and we think we found an easier way. But that easier way is always on us. It's not on the faith of God. David didn't take it. We see his reward. We shouldn't take it. Easier said than done. But then they attack them, and they die. That's the risk we take, going off on our own. Suicides are through the roof. Divorces are through the roof. Because we're going off on our own. We are separating ourselves from God. We see the hard situation, and instead of going through it, we say, oh, if I take two steps to the right, I can go around this obstacle. And our shield isn't getting stronger. But what we are doing is we are walking away from God. God is our protection. He is our shield. In walking away, we start taking hits. We start getting attacked. And we can't figure out why. And so what do we do? We start running further and further. And at some point, we blame God for not protecting us. But the whole time he's standing there going, you ran away from me, and now you're blaming me because you left all of your protection, and you're getting hit. First John 1 John 1.9 If I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. We have to come back. I've heard it. A story where a man goes to heaven and he's walking, and all of the days of his life are laid out in sand as footprints. There's two sets there, and he's walking through his life with Jesus, and he's remembering all the situations. But he starts to notice something, and that is every time he gets to the hardest parts of his life, there's only one set of footprints. And he looks at Jesus, and he goes, I, I don't understand. Why in my greatest times of need did you abandon me? And Jesus goes, look again. He goes, I I've looked at it. I, I keep looking. 
in those hardest times, you have abandoned me, and I walk alone. And Jesus says, look closer. Those aren't your footprints. Because you had faith in me, it is in those times of need that I carried you. That's the reward we have. Jesus will carry us through every situation. But we have to have the faith to leap into his arms. I thank you for listening to this study on the shield of faith and protecting ourselves against Satan's attacks. And I hope that it will change how you view your faith in situations, trials, and tribulations in your life and that you will anoint your shield daily moving forward especially this year where it's probably more important than ever before. Because we are in for a year, unlike any year I believe we have ever seen, especially here in the United States. But worldwide, things are starting to be put into place. If you're reading your Bible, it is falling into place. Only, if you're not trusting your Bible, do you believe in panicking because it's falling apart. He told us these days were coming 2,000 years ago. We should be faithful. And we should be praising Him for allowing us to see these days because they are the most prophetic days the world has ever seen except when Jesus Himself walked the earth and He has seen us fit to be here during it. 